Great. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Today is Tuesday, July 26th. This is the Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting. We'll start today with a flag salute by Supervisor Gore. Thank you all for being here today, and thanks for your patience. Um, and Robert, thank you for joining us from afar. We hope you're feeling well. Um, I'm fine, so, thanks. <laughs> so we'll start this morning uh, with uh, our first item on the agenda, and this is the appointment of Placer County Sheriff Coroner Marshall. And Jane, I'll turn it over to you. Good morning, thank you, board chair. Good morning, board members members of PCSO and, and certainly those here in the chamber and watching from home. I'm very pleased today uh, to introduce the next item, uh, the appointment of the Placer County Sheriff Coroner Marshal, Wayne Wu. A bit on current Sheriff-elect Wu. Sheriff-elect Wu has been a California peace officer for over 30 years. He began his career with Placer County as a deputy sheriff in 1994 promoted to sergeant in 2001, followed by lieutenant in 2007, and rose to the rank of captain in 2011. In 2017, he was appointed to undersheriff and has worked closely with Sheriff Bell during his tenure. Sheriff Elect Wu's service in the Sheriff's Office spans a broad scope of functions, including corrections, field operations, and investigations, including a de detective assignment working undercover in narcotics and special investigations. He holds a master's degree in justice management from the University of Nevada, Reno, and has also provided extensive use of force instruction for both the Sheriff's Office and Sierra College. He is a contributing member of instruction, I'm sorry, he is a contributing member of several state and national public safety associations and has been recognized by multiple community organizations for his superior service in law enforcement to the citizens of Placer County. So with that, Board Chair, back to you. So we're considering uh, this item, and uh, first up, I need to ask if there's any public comment before we entertain any motions on this item. Is there any public comment? Any online? Okay, then I'd entertain a motion. Supervisor Holmes and Supervisor Jones, and this will be a roll call vote. Gore? Aye. Wygant? Yes. Holmes? Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. And with that, you are appointed. Thank you. Thank you to the board um, for making this official today. I appreciate your support. Uh, it's going to be kind of a whirlwind of a day I think for me and uh, you know I don't know that I even expected this kind of support for this first part of it making it official this morning so I want to thank members of my team my family of course um, other elected officials in the room some countywide electeds um, Ed Bonner uh, been a mentor and, and supporter of mine I, I appreciate Ed being here today and I, I can't tell you how excited I am moving forward as part of the team um, to move this county forward and address a lot of the issues that we're facing. It's, it's kind of strange for me and hearing the bio and I started in 1990 and as I close out my 32nd year in law enforcement, <clears throat> a lot of people in public safety, you know, think I'm crazy because I, I think gone are the days where um, we even see a lot of people hit their max service retirement anymore, uh, much less go past it. And uh, I know I can hear Ed telling me right now it's a it's a cute start son at 32 years um, but honestly as I begin my 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 33rd year here in about a month or so and, and assume um, command of the sheriff's office I, I couldn't be more excited and more motivated um, to give back to this community to continue to serve um, to work with you 
uh, other members of the criminal justice system, all of our allied agencies and other department heads uh, to, to work through the challenges we face as a community moving forward, and specifically in law enforcement. We have criminal justice reform we've been facing, um, and here in Placer County, we have very extensive growth that we need to address, and we have such a wonderful community um, with some of the highest quality of life in Placer County, and I've just since I came here in 94, I've watched the county change a lot, and somehow we've been able to maintain such high quality of life, and we still have that small town feel, and I think it's gonna be a challenge for all of us moving forward as we just cracked 400,000 in population, and the projections show we're gonna to continue to go much higher, that we continue um, to make this the best place to live, work, and raise our families. We continue with that small town feel, and we continue to make it the safest community in the state of California. And I'm honored today to serve as your next sheriff. I can't wait to work collaboratively with all of you to, on behalf of the citizens of Placer County and move this jurisdiction forward and address all these issues as a team. And uh, I'm, I'm, I couldn't be more excited, even though I'm going into my 33rd year, it doesn't feel like it. So I guess that's a great place to be. So thank you so much for all of your support and thank everybody for coming out and supporting me today. I, I really appreciate it, thank you. Well, on behalf of all of our citizens and all of our constituents throughout our community, we are so fortunate, Sheriff Wu, to have you in this position. So thank you for 32 years and many more. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you. it. Any other comments, Board Supervisor Holmes? <clears throat> thank you, Chair Gustafson. Um, Wayne, I've watched you since I've taken office and seen how you've grown and how uh, you operate, and I'm very pleased uh, to see that. Uh, you say that you're excited. We're excited as well to see you uh, lead this fantastic organization uh, that's been had great leadership over the many years. And so, uh, again, I'm excited and I wish you well and I know we'll do well. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment and say thanks for just, you know, being there, um, being new. And so I feel like we're kind of you'll mentor me and we'll work together in our new and our new ja jobs and new chapters but i'm really excited for you and for your family and uh it's great to have you on board thanks so much thank you i'm looking forward to it robert did you want to chime in sure yeah congratulations wayne you uh ran a great campaign and that's a great indication of how well you perform really look forward to working with you the short time that i have um, but again, welcome, and uh, uh, I think we're on some exciting turf. I agree, and thank you, and thank you for all of your contributions as you're closing out towards the end of your career. We appreciate it. Thank you. And Supervisor Gore. I, thank you, Wayne, for being willing to step up to move into this role. Um, it's not easy. There are certainly a lot of challenges, but I really appreciate your willingness to do that. Um, I know you've got some terrific mentors, um, and you have a terrific team behind you. And um, I, I just know that there's great opportunity for our county um, as a whole, um, with your leadership with public safety. Um, we have residents who support um, our public safety. They support our deputies. Um, and so thank you for um, doing the hard work. It's not easy, but it really does matter. So I am excited for uh, the years ahead. Thank you, I appreciate it. So we have a request to take a quick photo with you down front. So we'll come It'd down be an and honor. join you. Thank you.
Wow, that's a great way to start the day. Thank you. Okay, we'll start now with our consent agenda. And uh, I'll look to see if there's any items board members would like to pull from the consent calendar. Board members, any items? Okay, I'd like to pull item 14A for a quick question. And I would entertain a motion then. Oh, I'm sorry, any public comment on any of our consent calendar items? Okay, I've not seen any, any online? Okay, then I'd entertain a motion for the remainder of the consent calendar. Holmes and Jones. All those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, we need to do a roll call today on everything, so. Gore? Wygant? Yes. Holmes? Jones, yes. Gustafson. Yes. And then I wanted to move to item 14A for a quick question. Um, I know Carrie Timmer is here, our regional forest health coordinator. Um, Carrie, if you'd come up. My question is, um, I really support uh, this grant and am so thankful to Cal Fire for the funding. Um, the match is almost 600,000. And I was wondering if Placer County Water Agency was uh, helping offset any of, of those costs, or is that all 100% the county's revenues? Yeah, it's actually uh, Placer County Water Agency indirectly helps offset that cost by paying a portion of the $50,000 that covers my staff time. And that comes through the Middle Fork Project Finance Authority. So both the county staff and the PCWA staff that work hours toward the French Meadows project uh, bill those hours to the Middle Fork project because the French Meadows project has benefit uh, to the water and energy operations of the Middle Fork project. So in essence, together, we are paying ourselves <laughs> mm -hmm. as part of that match. And the remainder is, uh, comes from the revenue from the sale of timber that is actually removed as part of the project work of the French Meadows project. And that just goes right back into the project to help subs subsidize the activities. So the timber, the revenues are from both PCWA's timber value as well as county timber value. By doing the project, both agencies are contributing. Yes. Because otherwise they could sell the, those funds. The, the timber. Well, the timber is actually from Forest Service land. It's yes, federal right. land that's being managed that we are managing under a master stewardship agreement. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's not, it, the timber doesn't really belong to any entity. It belongs to the project via the Forest Service agreement that allows yeah. us to do that work and remove that timber for purposes of forest. Harry, I think the point, and I, I'm doing this poorly, so forgive me. I just want to make sure that our taxpayers, we have forest projects needing to be done in all of our communities. And so I just want to make sure that if we're um, putting in funds, they're being matched by other public agencies. And in this situation, 100% of these funds are coming from the timber sale. So it's not general fund of the county. Exactly correct. Yes. Correct. That's why I just wanted to make sure that was clear for the record because it reads as we're doing a match of almost 600,000 without identifying that. So thank you for clarifying that. Oh, pleasure. I appreciate that very much. And um, with that, I would go ahead and move approval of this item. Okay, I'm sorry, public comment. Is there any public comment on this item? I see none online. Okay, great. Then motion and second, and it's a roll call vote. Gore? Aye. Wygant? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Thank you, and thanks, Carrie, for that explanation. Now we'll move on to our public comment. This is a time when people may address the board on items that are not on our agenda today. Um, and we would request that you keep your comments to approximately three minutes per person. And uh, we will allocate about 15 minutes this morning and come back to uh, public comment later. Good morning, Reverend. Good morning. I'm the Reverend Alex da Silva Soto. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs. And um, I, I sometimes wonder if uh, my reasons for showing up and some of other religious leaders showing up to your meetings um, is not as clear as some of us would hope it would be. So I thought I would take some time and clarify that um, the main reason is, is and 
main reason for my job is elimination of suffering and the root of suffering. And our neighbors encamped at the WIT are suffering. And this is the third month on row uh, since they moved to a new location that I have come before you with requests for water, a basic human need. There's a spigot just a few feet from them and some of them found those and we're trying to get some water from that but they, they were slapped in the hand and told that they cannot use it. So um, we have asked you many, many times for basic needs for our siblings and water is a big one of them. And it breaks my heart every time I walk by the fire pit in downtown Auburn, which is just two blocks away from our church, that we can provide a fire pit in the middle of the summer for uh, some of our residents, but we're still not providing potable water for our neighbors that are less fortunate. I'm taking a special collection this Sunday at my church, and some people are asking, well, isn't this a responsibility, an obligation of our county officials? And I told them it is, and I have been asking for months. And in addition to water, we have also asked many times for hand washing stations. We still in the middle of a pandemic and there's a um, monkey pox uh, virus going around. So hand washing stations, please. And we have already had some horrible, horrible days with the heat. And our siblings are essentially living in an uncapped parking lot. And we, I'm taking money out of my discretionary fund so there could be some shading structure on the site. So please, water, shade, ways for people to wash their hands so they can be healthy. And in addition to that, we still unable to park to bring water to our siblings because the closest place to park is 150 feet from the entry of this encampment. And those red curbs were not there before they were living there. They were painted recently. And in addition to that, I'm going to wrap it up. It's a secondary meaning of egress. There's only one opening into that fenced up area. If there's an emergency at that end at that opening, they have nowhere to go. So please consider these basic needs and help us meet them. Thank you for your time. Good morning. Good morning. My name's Richard. I appreciate the time. Um, as before, I'm sure I mentioned that uh, I'm a builder built hospitals, other large projects, became a construction consultant for the University of California. So I'm used to building large projects. Um, there's a proven technology, I've talked to you before about molten salt reactors. There's going to be a large uh, increase in the population of this county they're going to want electricity, I think. Uh, there's uh, the project I want to build was experimentally proven back in the 50s at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So this is nothing I just dreamed up. Uh, it's inevitable. It's just we need to get started on it. Okay, because it's the only clean, safe way to go. It's not the old water-cooled reactors which are dangerous. They've been proven dangerous over and over. Uh, I met with a lady at PG&E yesterday over at the facility by the airport. And I'm trying to get something to go investigate some issues with them. It's hard to do. Uh, even just finding the right person to talk to is damn near impossible. Um, I, I brought a, a letter to the board, and I please ask the clerk to pass copies out to the board, please. 
And uh, you'll see that the letter's uh, very cryptic because I could have written pages on each one of these paragraphs, but uh, I'd, I'd prefer that it be short so you can actually, your time's limited, so you can actually uh, read what I had to say. Uh, I would really be thrilled if you folks would start a committee on what you're going to do about the energy needs. They're coming. And I think you'll be better served if we get started now rather than later. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Honorable Board, Plaza County. My name is Vernon Barnes. I stood before you on July 12, 2022 to present testimony in the Giorita Variance hearing. <clears throat> At that hearing, I gave you a packet of documents, pictures, true testimony that implicated both negligence and corruption on the part of the Giorita's as well as past and present staff of Placer County building, planning, code compliance, and other departments as well. That evidence, as well as much more that I possess, I presented to you with the expectation that you would use it to right the wrongs of the past and fix an obvious broken part of our county government. In that packet, I included a code compliance notice that I received in the mail the, uh, the day before that hearing. Two days later, on July 14th at 2.15 p.m., I went outside to see what my dogs were barking at to find two young men that said they were from Placer County to check for code violations. I said, well, let's take a walk. Only one of them had a Placer County ID badge. I had said that that would not, or they said to me that that would not be necessary as they, as they had already walked my property and took pictures. I asked Raymond H., as it said on his badge, if they found any violations, and he said no. I said, well, this is unfounded then. I said that this was just plain retaliation. He said, yeah. That's what they had uh, heard in the office. The strange thing to me is that the, I was uh, not even given the 10 days that it stated in the letter to reply. Also, looking at six other code uh, compliance complaints, except for the one that I made to you directly about a fire in our neighborhood, the average is six weeks to six months before one code enforcement officer showed up for an inspection. Three complaints from uh, 2021 through January 2022 have still not even been addressed. So a complaint on me took two officers and only five days to serve. Where's my equal protection? Also, this was by definition an illegal search under your own rules. Where are my Fourth Amendment protections? I assure you the bad players will not win. Let me now be direct. This board, elected by the people, has a duty to the citizens of Placer County to root out corruption. You have 10 days to initiate an investigation of this Giorita case from 2003 to the present. I also require you to stop all harassment of my family, my property, my friends, my neighbors, by all county staff. This investigation will not be done in-house but by an outside government agency. I also ask again that when corrective action will be taken with the board's decision on the Giorita variance, as we citizens have been waiting 16 years for action from the board's decision of the last Giorita case. If you do not act, we will. Take control back from your agencies, please, in Placer County. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Good Mr. Day. Barnes. I have a letter here from a neighbor of mine who was placed in another 
medical facility for a uh, broken hip and all. And <laughs> I don't know if I can actually read it, but I'm asking if, or he asked if I could read it for him. If there's no time, I would like to present it as uh, for you. I, I think you can go ahead and quickly read it. I'll try. Okay. Well, if you can't, then. His, read, his writings will. Oh, okay. Well, then. Okay. Stop. Uh, uh, statement of Stephen Gilbert. Demand to stop uh, KKC, I'm assuming that's Cali Cecil, per 7-14-22 of uh, the meeting, an attempt to cover up past illegal uh, evidence, refer to 649 pages of the public record. Her request for changes were directly in response to Steve Gilbert's complaints, not addressed and brought to the attorney, I'm sorry, attention by Steve Gilbert concerning Board of Supervisors, Placer County, zoning, blah, 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 sorry, et cetera. Uh, I mean, legal counsel. Well, it sounds, Mr. Barnes, it's similar to what you just presented and, and gave Actually, us in the packet. Not, but it's a different case? It has to do with the public uh, hearing at the uh, Planning Commission on the 14th. Well, why don't you turn that in and okay. then we'll, we'll read that. And we really appreciate that you were able to uh, speak for him and put this into the record. Thank, Thank you. you. I wish I could read it. Yeah. <laughs> Madam Chair. Sorry. Yes. Can can we get copies? All of us get copies. Yes. This is great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, Don. Good Thank morning. you for being here. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, the time today. My name is Don Belden. I'm a longtime Placer County resident of the Blue Canyon Alta area. Currently the chair of the Placer Sierra Fire Safe Council and Firewise Community Coordinator for our community of Kearsarge Mill off of the Drum 4 Bay exit. And um, I'm a longtime volunteer fireman for the Alta Fire District, which is now under the um, direction of the Placer County Fire Department Company 98. Um, we're here today to, to just bring to your attention the increase in the truck traffic, commercial vehicle traffic on Interstate 80 through our community, our county, and the resulting uh, truck fire incidents that are coming along with it also. Um, you have some statistics in front of you that'll show a three-year upward trend and uh, year to date as of July 6th this year um, we look like we're gonna uh, squash the numbers this year um, which is not a good thing considering the condition of the of the uh, fuel load along the highway um, you can see that those are broken out to where some of those incidents have turned into a wildland incident um, We've had uh, most recent one that you probably were uh, made aware of or part of was the July 1 incident before the 4th of July holiday with the truck fire at Colfax. Um, tied up traffic for six, seven hours. Also resulted in a serious vehicle accident at Gold Run due to the backup. Um, rather lengthy extrication um, resulted in that with a helicopter flight of a patient to a local hospital. Um, on June 15th, we had a UPS truck, 53-foot trailer stuffed with packages, um, caught fire. It took uh, 16 firefighters up to four hours to unload that truck to get to the fire that was seated deep in the, in the cargo. It's a huge, um, it's a huge tie-up of our, of our assets on these incidents, the mop-up. Um, clean up. It's exposing a lot of the firefighters, CHP, Caltrans people to the very dangerous Interstate 80 traffic while we're out there. Um, long delays for uh, the public. Um, some of the solutions I see that we need to take a look at, one is enforcement. Not only are the speeding uh, trucks on the road, but the uh, failure to stop at the Blue Canyon brake check. Um, possibly increase the fines for these uh, drivers that fail to stop at the brake check and or have a, a, a hot brake incident further down the road. Um, 
the, I, the number one thing that needs to happen is we need to put pressure on Caltrans to get the right-of-way cleared. There's a huge amount of fuel load along the highways from Blue Canyon to Applegate. Um, our communities from Applegate to Blue Canyon are threatened on a daily basis, 24 hours a day, for uh, a major incident. And I think we're just riding on borrowed time at this point. So real quick, um, Caltrans has a large project slated for um, advertisement next summer. It's called the Monte Vista Pavement Rehab Project. They're going to um, add a, th a truck climbing lane from Gold Run to the Drum Four Bay Whitmore Grade um, area, about a three mile stretch. It's going to help uh, alleviate some traffic issues. They're going to put some wildlife crossings uh, along that stretch. Um, Dutch Flat Bridge gets replaced. This is a project that's probably going to be in the 100, 150 million dollar range, and I think it's a good time for us to to get uh, the Caltrans to say, look, you need to address the other issue, which is the large fuel buildup on the highway. Anyways, uh, thank you for your time, um, and I look forward to hopefully working together with you guys. Thank you, Don. And. I'm Jerry Rio. Some of you know me. I'm on the uh, Plaster Sierra Fire Safe Council. And it is, we, it is an issue. And we're going to lose one of your communities up there. We have, we've had scares. Uh, fires moving off and into Gold Run. Uh, people in Dutch Flat are worried. Alta all the way up. And uh, I, I personally think that one of the things that should be done is that the county work with Caltrans and hold a public meeting in the Alta area, for example. There were only, if I remember, Don and I went to the uh, open house that Caltrans had. I only recognized seven names on the sign-in list. There's a lot of people that won't drive the freeway. They're a little elderly or whatever, and there was no uh, handicap access available. So I would think that if we could have a meeting up there, talk about these issues forthright, would be a great start. Thank you very much. Great. At the end of public comment, I'll have some comments that I want to share with you, too. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, Gary. Good morning. Gary Mappa, Applegate. First of all, congratulations to Wayne Wu. I think he's a great addition to our long list of famous sheriffs. Um, next thing is I haven't seen this much firepower since I was in El Paso, Texas, doing the AT&T wireless project for AT&T. Today I'm here with some good news. One of my many hats as founder and vice president of Save Auburn Ravine, Salmon and Steelhead. I'm thrilled to announce, hopefully, the Vet Irrigation District has announced they will begin removal of the Hemp Hill Dam and restoration of fish passage on Auburn Ravine at that stretch. And upon completion, it'll give us six more miles of pristine spawning ground for salmon and steelhead. So I'm proud to share this good news with you instead of negatives. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And we have one uh, caller on Zoom. We do. Two? Beth, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Okay. Good morning. Um, I'm Beth Gonzalez. I volunteer with Placer People of Faith Together. We've been working with the DeWitt campers, residents, and I have similar concerns, of course, um, as the Reverend Soto. So I'm just going to go through my list and um, let you know what our concerns are. Um, quickly, it's shade. We need the boulders removed, parking for volunteers, easy access to water, and hand washing stations. And the Welcome Center is struggling. Um, it's pretty far. I've walked it myself when it's hot, like it, well, of course, it's open during the heat, which is a good thing. Could also be advertised as a cooling center. I don't believe there are any cooling centers in Placer County, but I would love for you to tell me I'm wrong. Um, I think it's, I know that it's our obligation as fellow citizens, fellow Americans to protect and defend. I don't see any protecting and defend here. 
And I also think that health and human services, um, that the residents are under the um, umbrella of health and human services, that there's a whole lot lacking here for health and human services. So I urge you all to please pay careful attention. There are a lot of things that are wrong. And if you take a visit, you may not feel guilty. I don't really want you to feel guilty though. I just want you to help. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you, Beth, for your comments. So we'll close the public comment. Uh, in response to a couple of the items that came up, Jane first on uh, the efforts at uh, DeWitt at the Government Center. Certainly, thank you, Board Chair. Um, our homeless liaison team has expanded its on-site presence to address many of the issues cited here today and continues to engage with campers, encouraging them to seek shelter and services through the adjacent HHS Service Center, which has now extended its afternoon hours. Guests primarily seek housing referral and process assistance, benefit linkages and troubleshooting, access to mental health services, water and light snacks, phone charging, and clothing. The team is reviewing parking with code staff and the fire marshal for adequate, safe, and appropriate site access going forward. And as I mentioned, continues to do daily on-site visits to the site to address these issues. Thank you. Jane, appreciate that. And I know um, that the efforts our staff are making out there. Yes, go ahead. And I have one other update for the benefit of the board and our viewing public. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Placer County's information technology team. Um, Hillary, I don't know if you want to come up to the podium. Uh, Placer County was awarded first place in the nation among U.S. counties of our size by the Center for Digital Government. The Center for Digital Government's 2022 Digital County Survey honors counties with innovative use of emerging technologies enhanced cybersecurity, which was recently cited by our grand jury as a best-in-class practice, um, as well as strengthened digital equity initiatives. The key projects highlighted in our survey response, our top survey response, I should say, included the broadband expansion program, the Ready Placer website, our cybersecurity program, and the technology supporting our nationally award-winning probation outreach vehicle. So kudos to the IT team. I know your director, Jared Thiessen, is out, Hillary, but thank you for being here to share this award with our board and community. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Ms. Christensen and Ms. Schwab. We're very proud of this. It really is a county-wide award. It's not an information technology award solely, and it just is exemplary of how we work together to try and make sure technology is serving our citizens. So thank you so much for your recognition today. Great efforts, Hillary. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, then we'll go on to any remaining board reports. I was going to just quickly report, I did ask Don Belden and, and Jerry to be here today to present to the full board this issue of the truck fires and the work along that uh, stretch of highway um, I get to drive it all too frequently and look at the forest on either side of the highway uh, and it, it really is um, just such a, a threat to our communities uh, to our foothill communities and all of those uh, up into the Sierra so um, I know our office is sending a letter to CHP on enforcement um, and asking for increased enforcement as you heard uh, at the MAC meeting when Don um, brought this forward, uh, there are about a thousand officers short throughout the state of California actively recruiting. Uh, I think that our sheriff was also actively recruiting at that meeting and so was fire. Um, but I also uh, know that Cal Fire is here today. Uh, Chief Estes couldn't be with us, but he has also directed some follow-up actions based on your comments, Don, and your service. Mike, I don't know if any of you want to say a few words on that. Good morning, board. The only thing I have is Chief Estes uh, is, is going to put a letter together also as the Plastic County Fire Chief to Caltrans to ask them to basically tag on to what Don and Jerry are doing with uh, clearing the roadways 
for better fire prevention. I'm, I'm so. sure I'm seeing the nodding of the board. I, I think all of us support the efforts um, to, to get more attention on this with the uh, amount of vehicle traffic just growing exponentially of the semis and the lack of training of these drivers and the threat of fire and what it does to our traveling public and commerce when we let alone the threat of catastrophic wildfire emanating from one of these um, is just horrendous so appreciate your efforts and chief estes efforts as well and all of the service and responding to the calls from these folks out there Absolutely, and as you all know, when the chief gives those uh, monthly updates, our calls do continue to increase along the I-80 corridor, and also driving it, you see the amount of traffic that is on there, so thank you. We're blessed and placer to have I-80, but we're also cursed by that effort. Did you get his name? His name. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> chief Rufinot. <laughs> Would you give your name for the record? <laughs> chief Mike Rufinot. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, Supervisor Gore, you had a report? Well, based on this conversation, it reminded me of an interaction that we recently had with Caltrans. I was at the Highway 65 JPA meeting um, a month or so ago, and the comment came up about the horrible condition of the on-ramp at Blue Oaks going on to Highway 65 towards Marysville. Holes in the road, and it, just terrible. And so we had staff reach out, send a request to Caltrans to get it addressed, and we were absolutely shocked because it got addressed within about a month. Um, and so I, I share that because I think that probably multiple requests to Caltrans from multiple groups of people could be helpful. Perhaps our public works um, department could send in a request as well as we do all these other efforts. Um, but when they hear it multiple times, maybe there's an opportunity to get some movement. So I would encourage us to, to reach out as many times as we can to Caltrans, especially in regards to issues like the one brought to our attention about I-80. Thank you. Any other board member reports? Robert, did you want to give a report? No, no I'm good, thanks. <laughs> How was the trip? <laughs> yeah, it was great, except for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> great. Okay, well, thank you very much for the public comment. Our reports will move on now to our 950. Oh, it's not... Oh, we're a little early on our timed items, so we'll go to a department item. Uh, yes, 9A, page 69 of our packet. Um, this is Electronic Health Record Agreement with California Mental Health Services Authority. Hi. Um, good morning, Chair Gustafson and members of the board. This is Amy Ellis with the Adult System of Care, and today I have two action items for you, your board to consider. The first is to approve a budget amendment, number AM-00680, in the amount of $1,265,306 within the appropriate accounts of the Health and Human Services Department's fiscal year 22-23 final budget. And the second is to approve an agreement with um, California Mental Health Services Authority, called at Cal Mesa, for the development and implementation of a semi-statewide electronic health record system in an amount not to exceed $3,406,353 for the period of March 18, 2022 to March 18, 2029, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to execute the agreement with risk management and county council concurrence and to sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. So for um, California's county behavioral health plans operate in an increasingly complex environment with demand increasing and workforce challenges, it's even more important to be efficient in our workflows and how we manage new requirements for compliance. So California's advancing and innovating Medi-Cal, which is called CalAIM, is this new in initiative that's meant to improve the Medi-Cal system one of the goals of CalAIM is payment reform and to simplify paperwork demands on the behavioral health workforce. Also, they uh, to have the ability to share information with other healthcare partners to better coordinate care. County Behavioral Health would need to overhaul our existing electronic health record system 
or choose to transition to a new, more modern EHR system with more with, with capabilities that would better meet the new standards. Many of these new requirements will go into effect for us on July 1st, 2023, and we've been preparing for these changes. Our current EHR system was built for the prior model of how we do billing and documentation requirements. It's a very old system. Some significant investments in time and cost would be required to meet the, the timelines and the new requirements. So the, the California Mental Health Services Authority, uh, Cal Mesa, who is a joint powers authority comprised of behavioral health directors across the state in coordination with the Department of Healthcare Services, um, is launching a new initiative to implement a semi-statewide EHR. This initiative brings over 20 participating counties together to co-create a new health record solution designed to support optimal care for beneficiaries and address our unique needs um, that are coming with Cali. This co collaborative solution empowers California counties to pool our expertise and resources to create a solution during a time of rapid change. So in collaboration with um, our, our HHS administration team, our county's IT department, our birth, birth the children's and adult system of care, we propose to opt in to this new EHR. It will have the benefit of increasing our capabilities related to staff management, client outcomes, state reporting, while also providing relief in the immediate future regarding staffing and financial resources. This endeavor is supported by DHCS, who is collaborating on the project, which will uh, reduce our audit risk to the county in future related to the administration of the mental health plan and drug medical organized delivery system. Cal Mesa has entered into a master service agreement with Streamline Healthcare Solutions, LLC, to develop a semi-statewide EHR called Smart Care Base. By entering into this agreement with Cal Mesa, Placer County anticipates having a new EHR system that will meet our business needs, be compliant with the new requirements, streamline our documentation, and provide easy access to data in a way that will ultimately improve quality of care and transparency related to behavioral health services. So the budget amendment is needed to increase appropriations um, for our 22-23 budget, but it will be offset with some corresponding re um, revenue increases from Mental Health Services Act funding. And this funding will be 100% state funds. And I know um, folks might ask, the first year of implementation will cost a little bit more as we transition the two products. But in the end, this product actually is a lower cost ongoing than our current, our current solution. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I appreciate that. Board members, any questions? I'm not seeing any. Any public comment on this item? And Robert, I, I'm going to just ca keep calling you out so I make sure I remember that you're there. Did you have any questions? Thanks, Cindy. I'm good. Okay. And I don't see any public comment. I'd entertain a motion to approve. Thank you, Supervisors Holmes and Gore. And roll call vote, please, Megan. Gore? Why can't? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Jones? Gustafson. Aye. Okay, with that, we'll move on back to, go back to our item, um, number two on our agenda, the Audit Committee Annual Report. Andy Sisk is here, along with others, to present this item to us. my little button I use? Yes. Okay. Good morning, board. My name is Jay Panzika, and I'm here with your auditor controller to present the previous year's annual report of the um, Placer County Audit Committee. Um, the report was previously distributed, and we have a PowerPoint for people to follow on if they'd like. As you can imagine, auditing is the most exciting topic this early in the morning, but we appreciate your time. <laughs> okay. So, a little history of the committee. It was created back in May of 2008. This was in response to the requirements put out by the AICPA, which is the American Institute for Certified Public Accountants. The goal was to increase quality and accuracy and mostly usefulness of the reports that are coming out of the counties and cities. Okay, the members of this committee are Supervisor Jim Holmes of District 3, 
Supervisor Suzanne Jones, District 4, the Vice Chair, and myself, the Public Member and Chair. Okay, the purpose of the committee is to um, fulfill your requirement to monitor various financial aspects of the county, specifically the financial reporting processes, the internal controls in place, compliance with laws and regulations, and I think most importantly also is, the, quote, the independence and performance of the county's internal and external auditors. What this means is, are your auditors doing a good job, and are they maintaining a independence and separation of the folks that they're auditing? For the activities this previous year, we met four times as a committee. Um, our external auditors talked about the audits that were performed of the county, and the internal auditors discussed the, the um, audits they performed by the county. Okay, so let's go with the external auditors first. Clifton Larson LLP as our external auditors. They performed a number of different types of audits that are listed on the report. I won't go through all of them, but I listed a couple here. The annual comprehensive financial report. The first five commission, the Tahoe Area Regional Transit and Treasury Review Panels. This kind of gives you an example of the breadth of scope that these auditors perform. The results of those audits, from their perspective, meaning the external auditors, but they had no serious difficulties in performing the audits, they had no disagreements with management, and they had no significant adjustments or disclosures that were missed by the audit. So that's the good news. Um, unfortunately, the audits came up with two deficiencies that were identified in internal controls. Specifically, they were considered, due to their seriousness, to be a material weakness. The first one was a prior period adjustment to a record donated assets that was missed and an understatement of property tax receivable. The result of that was, is triggering the county being rated as a high-risk auditee. Uh, this has never happened before the county, and the good news is this high-risk status goes away in two years if we ha uh, have two years worth of clean records. The actions taken to deal with that are um, specifically, almost by definition, an audit is an after the fact. And so your auditor is trying to move forward a little bit, now meeting regularly with some staff department, those that were involved, and assisting department staff where they can. The goal is to have no more material weaknesses like it was found. And uh, as I said, they cannot really control compliance because they're kind of watching what people do, but they're, they're trying to move that forward and work with them so these don't happen again. So that's a very positive response to the findings that were um, identified. Moving to internal audits, these are audits that were performed by your staff. Um, they did a number of audits, I mean, substantial number of audits. Some of them, again, are listed on the letter we distributed earlier. The procurement card programs, our credit cards, department head change reviews, year-end inventories, departmental reviews, whistleblower cases, confidential handling, that type of thing. They go in great deal of depth through um, going through these. So the results of those audits were, they, the, the results are reviewed with the appropriate staff. And otherwise, the people they audited are gone to, go through with what the audit found. They, came, they come up with strategies to figure out how to remediate anything that they found. Then they schedule up a, a follow-up audit and then perform those. The results of all these audits are presented to the CEO and to our audit committee for review and confirmation of the, the job they're doing. Um, we want to mention here real briefly your ACFR. This is the Annual Comprehensive Financial Report. You may have previously heard this called the CAFR, which is, they switched a couple of words. That has changed internationally because of um, better wording for how it's titled. Um, we wanted to say that um, the counties began submitting those to GFOA 20 years ago. The GFOA is a Government Finance Officer Association, which is a peer group that makes sure that um, we all share the best practice in what we do. All of these re um, reports have received the GFOA Award of Excellence, all 20 years, and all have received an un unmodified opinion by the auditors. For those who aren't familiar, an unmodified opinion is a good thing. <laughs> um, the committee conclusions, that's us group that's in the committee, um, based on our, con our conversations with our external auditors, Clifton Larson, Autumn, our internal auditors, auditor controller and assistant auditor controller, we believe that the county has a system of internal controls that is in place and is working and that the reporting processes are adequate to ensure the information provided fairly represents the county's financial position. I think that's really important because we want people to know what our true position was. We don't want to try to um, shade it one way or another. So we believe that it's our constituents and our taxpayers know accurately where their money is going and how it's being dealt with. 
And a final note, you've probably heard this a lot over the year, and it was a constant theme when we looked at the controls and the audits that were performed, that key management are leaving throughout the county. Um, what that means is you're losing institutional knowledge and fiscal knowledge, things that you have to learn in, over time. And what's happening now is, is departments are struggling with the loose, loss of staff. They reach out to the auditor to supplement this knowledge. That's a good thing that we're trying to transfer the staff knowledge from the auditor controller office out to the departments. The offset, though, is that they still have a job to do internally in their department. So that's the struggle that's been going on um, between the staff of both the departments and the controller. Uh, but they're trying to, to supplement this void, and they're working as best they can. Um, the auditor is going to try to do as much accounting training as they can with staff um, over the course of time until this current situation with um, staffing goes away. So on a final, final note, um, the auditor and his staff would like to thank you for your continued support. They have always recognized you, had, you have supported them and given them whatever they needed, and they're happy to say that thank you very much. So with that, I'd like to turn it back to the board for any questions. Um, Andy and staff are here for questions or anything that I can handle. With that. Great presentation, Jay, and thank you for all your service. Supervisor Jones or um, Holmes, would you like to say, make any remarks? Jay, thank you so much for the report, and I really appreciate your uh, on your being on the board, and thank you for finding this guy. <laughs> uh, really uh, give us great comfort uh, knowing uh, what we're overseeing the auditor and what the auditor does for uh, making sure Placer County is run correct, correctly. So thank you to staff, and thank you for your participation. Sure. And thank you. Add that it's a pleasure to work with all of you on the on the board. Thank you so much for your mm -hmm. support and participation and good work, always. Thank you. Right. Supervisor Gore, you had a question? I do have Come. a question, and thank you, Jay. Appreciate the report. And since I had sat on the committee previously, i just sort of curious. Um, I know that our, my colleagues are up to speed, but the issue with the credit card reconciliations and you know, sometimes concerns about the appropriate reporting of, of credit cards amongst staff, how is that going? Maybe, Andy, if you want to give us an update. I'm just curious, right, because that's that was a continual issue in the past. And yes. Good morning, Chair Gustafson, members of the board. Andy says, Auditor Controller. Uh, we routinely monitor the departments. We're doing this quarterly now. Uh, I'm pleased to say I think we just issued some quarterly reports, and I saw less and less observations, mm -hmm. which are typically findings. And uh, so that's good. It seems like the departments are doing a much better job with the credit card program as we move forward and so that's good uh, we're, we're pleased with some of the results we're seeing super I, I really appreciate that I know it was an issue and a lot of times you have to do continual um, training and reminding people of the importance of reporting and getting things done appropriately and on, yes. on time so I appreciate yes. it and we're also working very close with the procurement department to make sure that those controls are in place on the not only on the front end but also on the back end great thank you sure Great, thank you. I appreciate all the time and effort and how important this is to our taxpayers and constituents that we're reviewing our policies and procedures constantly and making Im improvements. Are there any public comments on this item? They're not rushing the stage here for this one. So uh, with that, um, we'd like to, uh, do we need a motion or we just receive it? Okay. Then thank you very much for your presentation. Appreciate it. Okay, I've had a request to move to item 10A, Public Works, Highway 49, Design Sewer Maintenance District 1. Take it a little bit out of order. So Robin, thank you for being here, and we'll move you up Hello. in timing. Good morning, Chair Gustafson and members of the board. Robin Mahoney, Department of Public Works. Today, staff is requesting three actions from your board. Number one, approve a contract amendment with Stantec Consulting Services. Contract number 13853 for $391,503 for a total contract amount not to exceed $973,531. Number two, authorize Director of Public Works or designee to execute changes to the contract up to $97,000. $350 consistent with county procurement policy manual. And number three, approve a fiscal year 2022-23 budget amendment AM00672 for CC12012 Sewer Maintenance District 1, 
project number PJ01560 in the amount of $488,853 and cancel sewer maintenance district one infrastructure reserves FD21000 T991012 in the amount of $488,853. Uh, for the background on this, um, additional capacity is needed in the Highway 49 sewer trunk line to accommodate existing customers and future development in Sewer Maintenance District Number 1 or SMD 1. Your board awarded a contract with Stantec on April 27, 2021 for $582,028 to design a trunk line upsizing project to increase the trunk line capacity <laughs> through a concept of upsizing the downstream section of the trunk line with the idea of upsizing the upstream sections at a later time. Stantec identified numerous constraints within the original design concept, causing them to question, causing them and staff to question the feasibility of construction. County staff and Stantec evaluated an alternative design concept and determined that it addresses all of the capacity issues within the entire trunk line under one project at a lower overall cost and with less disruption to the community. The alternative design concept requires additional work including design of approximately three times more pipeline for a total of approximately four miles, an odor control system, multiple horizontal directional drilling locations, and coordination with Caltrans. The total cost of the proposal from Stantec to design the alternative concept is $973,531. In 2021, staff applied for and received a local early action planning grant or LEAP grant through the Department of Housing and Community Development to fund $500,000 toward design of a project to increase capacity in the trunk line to in part accommodate for potential low-income housing development in SMD1. Project PJ01560 funds the work for, uh, for this design and up to 500,000 of this is reimbursable by the LEAP grant. After the work and the reimbursement are completed, remaining funds within the capital project will be transferred back into the SMD1 reserves. To adequately fund the alternative design and increase expenditure authority, staff recommends your board approve contract amendment for $391,503, authorize the director of public works or designee to execute changes to the contract up to $97,350, and approve a budget amendment in the amount of $488,853 to increase expenditure authority in project PJ01560 funded by SMD1 infrastructure reserves. So that, that's all I have. Um, do you have any questions? Thank you, Robin. appreciate that. Um, yes, Supervisor Holmes. Uh, thank you, Robin. Uh, I think I know the answer to this question, but what is the purpose of the local early action plan funding? Um, it, it's a grant that staff applied for in order to, um, to, to help uh, accommodate uh, low-income housing in sewer maintenance district one um, it's funding that was available and um, since the project is it, it uh, allows for additional capacity for existing customers and future development some of that development will be low-income housing so we we applied for it and we received it okay thank you very much you're welcome any other questions board members I'm not seeing any. Rob and I had a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, because we were able to get LEAP for the design, will is there potential for uh, grant funding for the project itself? And do we have an estimate of the total project, the actual construction costs? Um, yes, the total construction cost has been estimated with soft costs mm -hmm. uh, at uh, 17 million. Mm -hmm. And the um, the actual construction portion of it is estimated at 10 million. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, there is some available grant funding for construction that we will apply for, um, I believe, this fall. Mm -hmm. um, 
and um, I, I believe we're going to apply for up to five million dollars that I'm aware of um, toward that. Right. I was hoping that if we were eligible for the LEAP funding for the design that we would also have state support um, because it is an important project for affordable and workforce housing in our communities. Yes, we, we hope to get as much grant funding as, as possible to, yeah. to execute this project. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, appreciate the efforts to continue to find any sources of funding to help us with this infrastructure. Um, I'm not seeing other questions from the board members. Are there any public comments on this item? One on Zoom. Okay. Michael, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Uh, good morning, Supervisors. Mike Garabedian, Placer County, tomorrow. I have uh, one question about this, and that is um, what uh, publicly owned treatment works, a sewer plant that is uh, treats uh, the uh, uh, effluent in this piping system? Thank you. I, I can answer that question. Yes, go ahead. Um, uh, the, the sewer collected in North Auburn is uh, conveyed to the city of Lincoln, uh, where we are, we are partners in, um, we, we, we share the treatment plant in the city of Lincoln where it's treated. Thank you, Robin. I'm not seeing other public comments. I'd entertain a motion on this item. Thank you very much, Supervisor Holmes and Jones. And roll call vote. Gore? Aye. Wygant? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to go back. This is a, a <laughs> back and forth a day on the agenda. Uh, and Janine, thank you for waiting, but we'll move to your item now. Um, this is the continuance of the financing by the Western Placer Waste Management Authority of the expansion of its materials recovery facility and sanitary landfill. Janine Windenhausen, our treasurer tax collector, is here. Thank you, Chair Gustafson, members of the board, county council, and county executive. Um, there was um, a shortcoming in the original noticing for this item, and so uh, we have had to re-notice it for August 9th at 9.30 a.m., and so we're asking the board to open the public hearing and then to continue it to this time. Uh, County Council is looking at me. Actually, it's just continue. Yes, yes I'm sorry. for a continuance. Okay, great. Are there any public comments on this item or any questions from the board first? Okay, not seeing any, any public comments on this item. Okay, then I'd entertain a motion for the continuance. Okay, Holmes and Jones, thank you very much. And this is a roll call vote. Gore? Aye. Wygant? Yeah. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Thank you. And then we'll move then to our 1010 time item. Again, our treasurer tax collector, Janine Wynn. And Housen is here on Tax and Equity Fiscal Responsibility Act hearing. Thank you very much. Uh, to provide the board with some background, this is to refinance an existing project that was originally um, financed back in 2008. The project is for uh, Escaton facility in Granite Bay. So it's not a new project, it's an existing project and the action is related to refinancing uh, that project. So back in 2008, um, there was a similar hearing. Uh, Escaton is a nonprofit and under the Tax and Equity Fiscal Responsibility Act or TEFRA, uh, nonprofits can issue tax exempt debt, but because they're a nonprofit, they cannot comply uh, themselves with the requirement for a public hearing and a public benefit finding. And so they need to use uh, a board of supervisors or a city council or another public entity to facilitate the public hearing. Uh, process and be a conduit for that. There is no obligation whatsoever related to the debt um, or the financing or the facility in uh, the board taking that uh, action. And so you are requested to conduct a public hearing related to the refinancing of the outstanding debt um, and um, 
uh, to allow uh, members of the public to speak either for or against uh, the refinancing and then to adopt a resolution um, making a public benefit finding that the project is a public benefit as um, an elder care facility. So with that, I'd be glad to take any questions to the board and then the next step would be the, uh, the public hearing. Great, thank you very much, Janine. Are there any questions, board members? Robert, you're not waving me down, so no questions? Okay. No questions, thanks. Uh, okay. I yes, questions. oh, I'm sorry. I, yes, Go I ahead. do. Hi, Janine, thanks for that. Can you explain to me a little bit better why um, a facility like this that's serving the public and people do pay to stay there, why would the county re help refinance their debt? I don't understand. Again, um, this, this was a congressional act and it enabled nonprofits that are doing um, projects that are of public benefit to take advantage of tax exempt financing that local governments, uh, the type that local governments issue, which means the interest rate is lower. It means that their overall financing costs are lower. However, the act required that a public body conduct a public hearing as a nonprofit, they just don't have a venue for, con for um, noticing, for um, holding that public hearing, and then also they really do not have the jurisdictional authority for making a public benefit finding that your board does. So in other words, in order to take advantage of the tax-exempt financing, uh, they wanted to be able to have a conduit for public input and um, public comment. Okay, all right. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions from the board, so we'll open the public hearing. Does anyone want to address us on this item? Michael, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Uh, hello, thank you for this opportunity to ask a question. Mike Garabedian, Plaster County Tomorrow. And that is, uh, are the bonds going to be, or are they insured? Thank you. Thank you, Mike, Michael. And we have one other comment. Let's get through that okay. one, and then we'll ask Janine to address them. Ben, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Thank you. This is Ben Barker with the California Municipal Finance Authority. Um, I'm also available if there are any questions. And I, uh, taxes and bonds, bond insurance is not readily available anymore like it was pre-2009. So th these are not <clears throat> insured bonds they were like they were pre-2009. Okay, thank you. Janine? Yeah, I wanted to add a comment which I neglected to make earlier, and that is the issuer of the bonds is not the county, but is it is CMFA, the California Municipal Finance Authority, and Ben is a representative of CMFA. So this is not a county bond issuance. And for that reason, you know, we don't really want to get involved in a manner that then would bring responsibilities and liabilities to us. This is their issue, their responsibility, their obligation. We are simply being requested to be a conduit for a public hearing and a public benefit finding in terms of our community and, and whether it's a public benefit to have an elder care facility in our community. Great, thank you, Janine, great explanation. Um, are there any other public comments on this item? Then we'll close the public hearing and we have a suggested, um, the motion, the action would be to adopt the resolution. Do I have a motion? Okay, Supervisor Gore, do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Supervisor Jones. And then a roll call vote. Gore? Why again? Yes. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Have and a thanks good day. for being patient with our change in order there. Okay, um, we're too early for our 1030 timed items, so we will move to item 11A. Cure and correct letter. This is uh, found on page 121 of our board packet. And E.J. Avaldi, our planning director, is going to present this item.
Good morning, uh, E.J. Valdi with the Planning Services Division. I am joined uh, here today with our council, uh, Clayton Cook. So thank you, Clayton. Uh, so we are asking that your board authorize the chair to execute a cure and uh, correct letter to the law offices or to the law offices of Donald Mooney, uh, Mr. Mooney, who represents Paul, Paul and Carla Novaresi, uh, submitted a letter to the county on July 8, 2022 alleging that certain development review committee approvals for the park at Granite Bay project were done in violation of the Ralph M. Brown Act. Uh, the park at Granite Bay project is a previously approved 56 lot single family uh, gated residential subdivision uh, with a 0.81 acre neighborhood park located along Sierra College in Granite Bay. Uh, there were numerous, numerous uh, open public meetings held for this project. Uh, there was a draft EIR meeting with a planning commission uh, there were Granite Bay MAC meetings, uh, and then there were public hearings to consider the project with both the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors, uh, where it was ultimately approved in October 11, or on October 11th of 2016. Uh, Mr. and Mr. Mrs. Novaresi, the neighboring property owners, uh, filed a CEQA lawsuit over the project approvals in 2016. The county prevailed in this litigation at both the trial court, which was 2017, and the Court of Appeals in 2020. The Novaresis now assert that certain project approvals are in violation of the Brown Act. They are claiming that the issuance of improvement plans was not in conformance with the Brown Act because the DRC reviewed certain aspects of the plans. Uh, just for background purposes, the Development Review Committee uh, consists of county staff members from various departments who review certain development project components. Uh, the staff project review group, uh, as it is stated in county code, is selected by the Community Development and Resource Agency Director, uh, and it typically includes professional uh, staff assigned to an individual project. Uh, these members are not elected positions, nor are they appointed by your board. The term Development Review Committee has been referenced in county code dating back to 1972. Uh, the reference and uh, current structure of the DRC has been in place since 1995, prior to formation of the Community Development Resource Agency. In regards to the Park of Granite Bay Improvement Plans, county staff acting as a DRC reviewed uh, the plans for condition compliance prior to issuance of those plans. Uh, I will point out that the term DRC has been broadly used at times uh, and referenced in conditions of approval to assure that approved project conditions are adhered to. Uh, although the intent has always been that this is a staff project review group, uh, Mr. Mooney has pointed out that specific conditions of approval for the Park at Granite Bay project require DRC approval. Uh, staff does not agree that the DRC review of these conditions uh, is subject to the Brown Act. Uh, however, based on Mr. Mooney's assertion, uh, we will be reviewing and determining whether rescission of the improvement, plans, uh, uh, improvement plan approval is warranted. Uh, if it is, the improvement plans would be rescinded and brought back during the public, uh, a public DRC meeting for consideration. So for now, staff is required to respond within a 30-day time frame to address the perceived Brown Act violation. And we are asking that you execute the cure and correct letter to Mr. Mooney. Uh, I will point out that staff has already begun looking at changes to our county code. Uh, the DRC is mentioned in at least five chapters of county code. Uh, not just uh, the zoning ordinance. Uh, and that's based on, uh, you know, we started this process based on previous comments from a planning commissioner. Uh, uh, also changes in state law such as SB 330, you know, which you're all aware limits, uh, you know, hearings to five. Uh, and then uh, also in light of this recent letter from Mr. Mooney. Uh, so I, as well as Clayton, are here available for questions. Thank you, EJ. Are there questions, board members? Okay. Is there any public comment on this item? Not seeing any, then uh, we would, um, I would entertain a motion to uh, authorize the chair to sign this and execute this letter. Supervisor Jones, thank you, and Supervisor Holmes, and roll call vote. Gore? Aye. Wygant? Yes. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Thank you both very much.
Okay, then we're going to move on to uh, item 12A, and this is on the River Fire. And do we have Dave here, or is he on Zoom? Okay. We got to you early. Thanks, Dave. All right. Well, good morning, Dave Axton, Assistant Director of Emergency Services. Happy to be with you, be with you here today uh, to give you an update on the River Fire and to ask your board's uh, concurrence with some staff recommendations. So, at first, we just want to remind everyone that. Um, you know, recoveries from disasters is complicated. Uh, it's really more of a continuum than a series of steps, you know, one after the other. It's you start one thing, you also start something else. And so uh, a lot of times that um, people might wonder, well, why are we still in a certain phase? And so our purpose today here is to walk you through a little bit about what, what's been happening since the river fire and, and then to help your board understand why staff is making the recommendation that we are today. So just a quick reminder, the river fire started August 4th, uh, 2021, almost a year ago now. Uh, burned about 2,600 acres. I think a 2,619 was the final number. We had a number of people that were evacuated, managed to get most of them back in their homes pretty quickly, but not all of them uh, right away. And then, of course, we lost a number of homes, 42, or excuse me, 40 six in Placer County and then um, uh, another uh, almost the same amount in Nevada County. Uh, we were had a, a unified response between Cal Fire, Placer County Sheriff and Nevada County Sheriff. Of course, this uh, burned through the Bear River drainage and we had uh, uh, a unique situation that, that happens more often than not anymore in terms of having multiple counties and multiple jurisdictions involved in the incident at the same time. So almost immediately, we begin what we call impact assessment. We're looking at the scope and the scale of what happened, uh, not only the homes that were potentially lost and the other structures, but looking at the economic impacts, natural resources, uh, you know, livelihoods. We have a lot of folks now who you know, work out of their homes. This was still during, during parts of COVID. How do we handle that? And just trying to better understand exactly what was happening so that uh, we could come back to your board and get some uh, much needed public policy uh, pieces in place. And these included the local emergency. We then had a local health emergency. Your board saw fit to do some fee waivers and then ultimately a urgency ordinance that um, allowed for a private property debris removal program, which I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, one of the the key concerns right away, uh, this happened in August, but we knew that the rains were just around the corner. The Bear River is one of the major watersheds in the area between the Bear River and the Bear River Canal, convey a lot of raw water that are used by a lot of this region uh, into Sutter County and other areas. And so it was really important that we got uh, as much understanding as we could and as much uh, protection in place as we could right away. Uh, for the natural resources that were in the area to ensure that those uh, stayed protected. Uh, we were fortunate that the early actions that your board took uh, allowed for us to reach back to the state. Uh, we got a, a five-day mission from the California Conservation Corps. We got a mission from the Department of Water Resources for them to come out and provide some erosion control as a picture here. And then also we were fortunate enough to get a water um, uh, essentially an assessment of the, the area and its potential for any kind of debris flows. Uh, what, uh, what happens after fire is there's a chemical reaction that occurs with the soil that actually makes the, the soil what's called hydrophobic and so it starts to repel water and so it changes the characteristics of, of what might happen when it rains or especially when it rains uh, a lot in a very short amount of time. Uh, we actually did have the unfortunate um, event uh, actually, in late October, uh, National Weather Service uh, predicted some heavy rains in a very short amount of time. It's the first time that I'm aware of 
that a wireless emergency alert has been issued in Placer County. That was actually done by the National Weather Service, and we did end up evacuating a couple of folks uh, out of the River Fire area and closing some roads uh, just to keep people safe because we weren't sure exactly how uh, this uh, topography was going to react to the storms. Thankfully, they weren't any major um, major debris flows, and there weren't any issues or any further further significant damage. Uh, infrastructure, as I mentioned, between the Bear River and the Bear River Canal conveys a significant amount of water and raw water through this area. Uh, very important pieces of infrastructure. That is in addition, of course, to the communications infrastructure that was lost in the fire, the electrical distribution, and then also the potable water uh, with PCWA. And so uh, all of this infrastructure uh, that was damaged need to be uh, assessed and then, of course, repaired or protected. Of course, the big piece of all of this is the debris cleanup. And uh, as I mentioned, we had uh, 46 homes destroyed. Uh, that presents a significant challenge in terms of household hazardous waste, right? You think about what's underneath your kitchen sink, right? In terms of pesticides or even just your five gallon or 10 gallon can of, of propane that you keep for your barbecue, right? All of these things now present uh, challenges and um, possible concerns as people go to clean up, which is why those local health emergencies and that urgency ordinance is so important to allow uh, you know, professionals to get out there who can do this work safely, to assess the situation, remove those materials safely and effectively, and then give folks the option, if you wanna continue with the state-run program, great. If you wanna do it on your own, great too. Your, your board saw fit to provide both of those options in the urgency ordinance. Most people chose to go with the state-run program, 42 of those. Uh, another three chose to do it on their own. Both were cleaned up to the same level. Um, some in interesting statistics, out of all of the homes that were cleaned up, at least as part of the state-run program, 20% of those uh, came back with some level of asbestos contamination in the upper areas of the soil. As most folks know, um, early home construction, a lot of asbestos was used in insulation. That, of course, burns, becomes friable. Now we get rains on top of that that starts to infiltrate the soil. So part of the state-run program was to do soils testing. They would do a test. If it came back at a level that wasn't appropriate, they would scrape the soil, test again, and we had about 20% of our properties uh, ultimately um, uh, needed that level of work. Just in the state-run program, 17,000 tons of debris was removed uh, from those home sites. That's in addition to 86 burned and destroyed vehicles and motorcycles and campers, things like that. Um, so the debris cleanup program, probably the, one of the single biggest, I would say, benefits, direct benefits to uh, our survivors. This allowed for the cleanup to occur, uh, essentially at no expense to the property owners. Those that did have home insurance, if their home insurance had a specific amount set aside for debris removal, uh, that will ultimately go to the state. But beyond that, this leaves intact the entire amount for uh, that insurance to go to either rebuilding or whatever other um, you know, uses that those property owners want to make. So we were, we were pleased uh, to be able to bring that to this. Uh, survivor assistance, in addition to the debris removal program, uh, we very quickly uh, were fortunate to get a federal disaster declaration. Uh, we were fortunate not only to get a d disaster declaration, but that, that disaster declaration included individual assistance. For example, the Caldor fire at the moment, I believe, still does not have individual assistance associated with it. So uh, we were very fortunate there. Uh, that resulted in some direct assistance from the federal government to survivors. That is in addition to just over a million dollars in small business administration loans for, uh, for survivors as well. Let's see, there we go. Community support. Uh, we are very fortunate that we have a, a great community that we live in, that people support each other, understand uh, what goes on. Uh, the Placer County Community Family Foundation uh, stepped in immediately. Uh, they ultimately gave uh, just over, not quite $250,000 to the River Fire efforts. Uh, most of that going directly to survivors, a little bit actually was given to Nevada County survivors and some of it went to the Red Cross who were great partners for us when we had to open an overnight shelter. Uh, rebuild, um, pleased to report that we have five permits issued 
and another four in review, in, um, in review right now. So uh, for those that are choosing to rebuild, they're moving along steadily. Uh, as I think it was noted in an earlier meeting that uh, the building department is prioritizing uh, any permits that come through for river fire survivors in the effort to, uh, to try to get them moved through quickly so they can get going on rebuilding. Public information, so important through this whole process, right from the beginning, uh, whether it's environmental engineering, helping with places to put spoiled food, uh, our local assistance center, of course, uh, our partners with CAL FIRE and the sheriff's office. So between 211, social media, we had a we had a direct um, a mailing list set up uh, for survivors. We're still sending them information uh, uh, on you know, different seminars and things that are available to them in terms of uh, you know, how to go through the building process or options that they might have. Uh, so we, are, we will continue that level of support through this process. Uh, and then of course, cost recovery. Um, as you can imagine, uh, dealing with the state and their federal government on trying to get money back has been challenging, uh, but we're working our way through it. I'm pleased to report that we should be getting our first check from the federal government any day now for $110,000, which is of just about 90% of the eligible costs uh, that we'll be getting back for our emergency protective measures. And then on top of that, we'll be getting an additional amount from the state, and then we are still working with them on cost recovery for the debris removal work that we've been doing. and. Um, Good time to, to just to mention the great work that environmental health partners have been putting in and taking the lead on that private property debris removal program. They've just done an outstanding job advocating for, for our residents and survivors. That of course takes work to put together the materials needed to, to do the appeals and get through those, those kind of things with the state and the federal government. Um, but they've been doing a great job and, and we're working to help them recover their costs on that as well. So just to bring you back kind of through the continuum, uh, obviously we, we've, we've been through the disaster. Uh, we've been through the short term in terms of getting people in some kind of housing if they needed it. Um, some other things that are happening on that front, uh, we were able to, with uh, Cal OES, secure a grant for uh, what are called case managers. If folks need help navigating the process, whether it's building permits or additional assistance through the state and the federal government. Uh, Cal OES is contracting with Connecting Point, who also happens to be our 211 provider, just to help people get through that process, right? Not all of us are, are uh, I guess, of the right frame of mind to help deal with, uh, you know, what might be perceived as a lot of, lot of uh, bureaucracy and hoops and that to, to jump through to get the, the help that they need. So just having a, someone who's, who understands the process and know who's to call, know, knows who to call uh, should they need some additional assistance has, has been a help for them. So staff believes, and I've been working closely, especially with environmental health, that, that we're at the point where we're, we're sort of turning the corner, we're in transition. Uh, you can see from the graph there that the, the national response framework uh, ends response just as uh, inter intermediate term post-disaster recovery is occurring. And I would put forth that that's kind of where we are right now, uh, which is why staff is recommending that your board take the actions that we're proposing today. But we'll get to those in just a second. And with that, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dave. I got to see this the other night at the MAC meeting up in Colfax, so appreciate yep. seeing it again and all the hard work put in, you and your team. Any questions, board members? Um, Dave, I had one. Do we have any information on the other 38 property owners, if they're going to rebuild, or do you? So we've heard sort of anecdotally, some folks are choosing not to rebuild at this time. Um, you know, I've kind of heard that some folks are, you know, they're just not ready personally. Well, and construction costs are a yeah. little high right Absolutely, now. Absolutely, <laughs> right. So there's just a lot that goes into that. Um, so, you know, we continue to stand ready to help those folks when they do make that decision. Um, but at this point, you know, it's, it's really a personal choice for each of those families to, to decide, you know, kind of what, what they want to do yeah. and when. Well, I really appreciate that we're expediting and helping those who do want to rebuild as quickly as they can and get back in their homes. Absolutely. So I appreciate that. I don't see any other questions. Are there any public comments on this item? Okay, then we'll bring it back to the board. We have three actions. Can we do this in one motion? 
County Council? We can, but I think yep. um, oh, I'm sorry, Dave. Sorry, I do need to read, uh, just make one m mention for the record. Uh, in putting this all together, we did find a, a typo in the resolution for the third action. Uh, the date for the local health emergency ratification was incorrect. It should be August 31st instead of August 10th. And I believe all the rest of, of the uh, resolution information is correct. And, I think the and for the is record, that is the ordinance, I'm sorry, that, the ordinance. where we found that the typo. Yep. And you have the uh, corrected ordinance. The corrected ordinance. You. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Dave. Yep. Okay, then I would accept a motion uh, for uh, adopting the two resolutions and the ordinance. Okay, Supervisor Jones, Supervisor Holmes, thank you. Roll call vote. Gore? Wygant? Yes. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Thank you, Dave, and thanks to the whole team that's helped put this together. Okay, now we'll go back to our 1030 timed item. And Michelle Kingsbury is here, our principal management analyst on this item, Sabre City Park Estate Subdivision. Hi, good morning, uh, Chair and members of the board. Michelle Kingsbury with the Community Development Resource Agency. Uh, this is one of two items that are before you for consideration. Uh, the first one um, is Sabre City Park Estates, which is located in the Dry Creek uh, Community Plan area. And this action today is to confirm the process to annex them into our county service area 28, Zone of Benefit 165, which is for the Dry Creek Fire. As part of the conditions of approval, typically for projects located in the Dry Creek Community Plan area, these projects are required to annex into uh, that zone of benefit. Uh, Sabre City Estates is an approved 24 lot subdivision located in the Dry Creek Community Plan area, and this will satisfy this action today, their condition of approval uh, for their will serve and to annex into the zone of benefit. I think with that, um, we can move on to the actions. It's pretty quick. Uh, these are administrative um, processes um, and to conduct the public hearing and see if there's any protests and then have the ballot and move forward. Board members, any questions before we open the public hearing? I'm not seeing any. Then we'll open the public hearing. Are there any public comments on this item? Not seeing any. Uh, then we'll close the public hearing. And Megan, will you tabulate the ballots? We received one ballot on this in favor. OK. With that, I would entertain a motion. Uh, the approval of the item. Second. Thank you, Supervisors Gore and Holmes. Roll call. Gore? Aye. Wygan? Yes. yes. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Thank you, Michelle. And then you're up for the next item, the 1035 item, Double S Ranch Subdivision. So good morning again, Michelle Kingsbury with Community Development Resource Agency, and I'll probably be faster than I was the last one. <laughs> again, this is an annexation request into the Dry Creek uh, Fire Services Zone of Benefit 165. This is for Double S Ranch, which is also located in the double, excuse me, located in the Dry Creek Community Plan area. It's an approved 36-slot uh, residential subdivision um, about around Cook Riello Road and Vineyard Road up in the Dry Creek Community Plan area. Um, this action today, again, will satisfy their conditions of approval to annex into the zone of benefit. I think with that, happy to answer any questions. Any questions, board members? OK, then we'll open the public hearing. Are there any public comments on this item? Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing and, oh, I'm sorry. Please come forward. Question on the wildlife in the area, Michelle, can you address that? Uh, sure, it is an approved project that went forward through our planning process, so conditions of approval that are pretty typical with projects where they'd have to mitigate uh, are, are part of this. We can um, email links if you'd like uh, to the approved project approvals. Project approvals. Could you um, talk with, uh, yes, sir? Oh, sorry. I can talk a little louder. So this is an approved project that went through our planning process. Uh, this is an administrative action just to satisfy one of the conditions of approval. But what I can do is get their uh, email or neighbor address and we'll email them the link to the project approvals, which would have uh, the appropriate mitigation measures as it relates to uh, wildlife. Okay. 
Did you have any other questions? You've sat here patiently for a while. I want to make sure we address any other questions you have. Yes. Oh, hold on. Let us bring you a microphone because we need this uh, on the public record. And if you could give us your name. Thank you. Yeah, Gordon Gimble. Um, anyway, what I'm, aren't they in the fire district already? I don't understand what this is all about. I can answer that question. So they're located in the boundaries of the former Dry Creek Fire Protection District. That Sorry, uh, they are located in the boundaries of the former Dry Creek Fire Protection District, and this is simply a confirmation of that we're annexing them um, into it. It's an administrative process, um, and so it may, and it's just a, a, once the property is confirmed to be annexed in, then they get the assessment on their tax roll to pay additional revenues that support the fire services in that area. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I'm not seeing any other public comment. Then we'll close the public hearing and I'd entertain a motion. We have to tabulate the ballots. Oh, I'm sorry, tabulate the ballots first, thank you. Chair, we received one ballot on this in favor. Thank you. Okay, with that, I will entertain a motion. I'll move approval of the item. Second. Thank you, Supervisor Gore and Holmes. Roll call. Gore? Aye. Why get? Yeah. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. And Michelle, if I could ask you just to chat with these folks um, in case they had any other questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move to our 1040 timed item. This is the establishment of zone of benefit number 236 in County Service Area 28. And uh, this is in the Homewood area. Hi, Will. Yes. Good morning, uh, Chair Gustafson and board members. My name is Will Garner, Placer County Department of Public Works. And uh, this item we have before you today is the um, approval of a zone of benefit and also separate from that, approval of uh, additional direct charges to the tax roll for the Homewood uh, development. So the Homewood Master Plan was approved in 2011 and it's, it's over 1,200 acres, but the item before you today is really 5.7 acres of that 1,200. Um, and um, so Holman is moving ahead with that right now, and they'll be seeking approval for their final subdivision map for a portion of that area next month here before your board. Uh, a condition of approval for the project was, one of them anyway, was to uh, form a zone of benefit for typical street maintenance activities, and that's what uh, we're bringing forward today. Um, and the engineer's report for this zone found that the addition of storm drain features to provide that will provide um, uh, storm drainage for that area provides special benefit to the subdivision and will be maintained through this assessment along with some typical uh, administrative fees to manage the uh, zones of benefit. The assessment is calculated at $197.67 per year with an annually adjusting um, CPI that will go along with that and um, that will be only for lot three of the two lots there's lot three and lot five only lot three receives special benefit um, through the analysis in the engineers report in addition to the zone of benefit there there is also a condition or an agreed-upon item within the development agreement for Homewood that requires an annual payment of six thousand two hundred and fifty per year um, every year for class one trail maintenance and beach maintenance and then three thousand dollars per year for national pollution discharge elimination system water quality monitoring um, and that again will be separate from the zone of benefit and and those were contained in the development agreement approved in 2011 um, so that will be asking you today to approve those charges to be charged to the tax roll for the two common area parcels that will be owned and managed by the homeowners association at Homewood. Um, and this is also required for Homewood to seek approval and get approval of their final subdivision map, which again would come to you probably next month. Um, so notices have been posted on site in the newspaper 
um, and the owner has been supplied the ballots and waivers. And um, with that, we're recommending three actions this morning. And uh, the first, of course, is to conduct a public hearing to tabulate ballots and hear and consider protests, if any, to the creation of county service area number 28, zone of benefit 236, and determine whether written protests to the creation have been the creation of the zone of benefit have been received from a majority of the property owners. And then also, uh, as part of this public hearing, to consider the establishment of a direct charge to the tax roll for class one trail maintenance, beach maintenance, and water quality monitoring. Uh, actions two and three also involve uh, the adoption of a resolution. I just want to point out for the record, it's the adoption of the very same resolution uh, for two different actions. And the first action is to uh, create zone of benefit number 28 um, for $196.67 per parcel. And by the way, I didn't mention there'll be seven parcels on this um, lot three that will be paying that amount. Um, and that will be subject to an annual cost of living modification, and that is for storm drain maintenance. And then the third action, also in this resolution, is to establish a direct charge to the two common area parcels created for Homewood Lot 3 and Lot 5, and I have the parcel numbers noted here, um, for the trail, beach, and storm water um, quality monitoring program. And uh, with that, I can take any questions and turn it back to you. Thank you, Will. Appreciate that. Are there any questions, board members? I have one. <laughs> Are they, as part of the master plan, are they building the segment of trail that will connect the Homewood? Because currently, I believe yeah. it's just on the pavement. And so that is what they'd be maintaining so, in the So future? actually, the, the maintenance charges are for general um, trail, trail maintenance. maintenance in the area. Okay. And, but as I know, as part of the improvement plans, there's also additional trail. Being, okay. Yeah. And so the development would be, because that'll be across their private property. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I was clear on that. Okay. Thank you, Will. And we will uh, open the public hearing now. Are there any public comments on this item? Okay. Then we'll close the public hearing. Uh, Megan, will you tabulate the ballots? We received one ballot in favor, and we did not receive any protests. Thank you, Megan. Then I would look to my board members for a motion. I'll second. Thank you. Supervisor Holmes and Gore. Megan, will you call the roll? Gore? Aye. Wygant? Yes. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Thank you. Finally moving forward. That's great. OK. We are now at 10.51, so we can start our 10.50 timed item. Hi, Gloria. Thank You're you for doing being an here. Job. Can I just say? This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all my doing. Uh, Arts Council of Placer County Amendment to Consultant Services Agreement. Hi, Gloria. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Gloria Stearns with Economic Development. When people think of arts, they don't always think of economic development first. Yet back in 2002, Richard Florida wrote The Rise of the Creative Class, which, and I quote, put forward the intoxicating idea that where creativity gathers, economic success follows. This creativity can take a number of forms, fine arts, performing arts, public art, art events, and more. Plus, art is naturally inclusive, as people of all ages, backgrounds, and abilities tend to self-select in to their preferred medium when given an opportunity. So we are pleased to partner with the Arts Council of Placer County as their services complement our economic development strategies. Looking ahead, we are working with the ACPC on better ways of tracking specific numbers so we can more accurately report on community outreach and economic impacts of their efforts. Today, we will hear the annual report from Jim Crossway, the Executive Director of ACPC, before you consider action on a budget amendment. Jim? Thank you so much, Gloria. Jim Crossfit, Executive Director of the Arts Council of Placer County. Very happy to be here. And uh, uh, board, we are very grateful to the Board of Supervisors for the support of the Arts Council uh, over the years. Uh, we work very hard to uh, 
enhance our contract with you and make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and very proud of all the people I'm associated with. Uh, we are now, our team's been here for five years in September, which I know pales in comparison to the sheriffs who went before us this morning. <laughs> with new sheriff will be in here 40 years, or 32 years, but we, we do have a longevity boast. Uh, next year will be the 40th year of the Arts Council of Placer County. So all of 2023 will be, uh, will be uh, celebrating uh, arts and culture in Placer County and uh, uh, doing a lot of fun stuff. So again, thank you very much for all that. Uh, You've done for us. Um, I do want to recognize some people today. Uh, our uh, board members, our volunteer board members, who have done such a wonderful job to guide us in the right direction. Uh, two of them are here today. Barbara Burge, our chairperson, is here today, and Julie Gilmore, who is our secretary. They're both here today. Uh, recognizing also Tawana Armstrong, our vice chair, and members Unity Lewis, Jacob Stevens, Gabriel Gonzalez, and Tiffany Walker all do a great job. I'm really, really proud to be involved with all of them today. Hmm? <laughs> Stephanie is not one of our board members, but we would like we would love to recruit her. <laughs> Thank you for stepping up, Stephanie. We appreciate it. Look at that. You got a Commercial. That was a commercial for our board right there. <laughs> Uh, we also have a very uh, a small but mighty team. Uh, I'd like to recognize Patrick Storm, Darcy Frank, and Trent Wasabi, who are our main people. Uh, Patrick does all of our social media. Darcy does our graphics and newsletter. And Trent is our website director. And uh, they just do a marvelous job. Uh, what we're here for today is to look at the second year of our contract that's coming up and, and looking for some new amendments. Gloria already talked about the first one which was changing some of the language so that we have better economic impact factors in our reports from our grantees. Uh, that's important. Uh, speaking of grantees, the other thing we're asking for is $35,000 increase in the amount of funds for the grantees. Uh, we'll show you in a little video we have coming up just the, uh, the requests we're getting and the importance of these grants. As uh, you know, the old comment goes, we created a monster. I wouldn't want to use that terminology, but we really have created quite a, quite a need for uh, our grants in this community. And uh, then the other thing is that we have another $7,500 that we want a lot. We're in a partnership right now with the county on our community mapping study, which will be concluding their first half uh, in the next month. We'll give you a report on that. But we've been very pleased with our consultants on that. The foremost has done a great job, and uh, we're looking forward to the results of that. So uh, in conclusion, uh, any questions afterwards, I'll be glad to answer those. But right now, we just have a short video to show you that kind of sums up who we are and uh, what we're doing. So thank you. Since 1983, the Arts Council of Placer County, also known as ACPC, has been serving the communities of Placer County by supporting quality visual arts exhibits, tours, and events. We also provide funding to local artists, makers, and organizations to advocate for all arts across Placer County. ACPC believes art should be a part of everyday living, and when it is, everyone in the community benefits from a higher quality of life. The Arts Council of Placer County has also completed the first phase of our cultural mapping study. This survey is the most recent outreach effort within a larger cultural mapping study. And we have already completed one-on-ones with community leaders, organizations, and focus groups. This survey includes research about demographics, trends, and other factors that impact arts and culture in Placer County. Additionally, we would like to express a heartfelt thank you to everyone who participated and completed the survey. ACPC has also published two magazine quality arts and culture guides, one in the fall and winter of 2021 and the other for the spring and summer of 2022. These publications have been used at outreach events and have been distributed to all of our communities in Placer County to help promote monthly events, festivals, and local artists. ACPC has also distributed monthly e-newsletters and announcements via our digital subscribers, as well as on our social media pages. On Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, ACPC has over 4,300 followers, and over the past fiscal year, we have reached over 112,000 people on social media. Our efforts have been focused on assisting artists and organizations to help share their events and updates. 
by sharing these stories, we have helped to facilitate over a dozen earned media interviews to promote arts and culture in Placer County through print, radio, and TV news programs. Through our social media, we have continued to also share and support our artist organizations and events directory and leveraged support with the endowment from the Placer Community Foundation. During November, Arts and Culture Month, ACPC also established a text to donate fundraiser to facilitate direct donations of gifts to local art related nonprofits on Giving Tuesday. During the big day of giving, ACPC focused our messaging to support individual donations directly to all of Placer County's arts and culture nonprofits and not directly to ACPC. Our community arts grants have provided the biggest impact. In fiscal year 2021 to 2022, ACPC awarded $85,000 in grants to 50 arts organizations. Unfortunately, we had worthy grant requests from 89 organizations totaling over $234,000 in grant requests that we were not able to award. Let's take a moment here directly from five of our grant recipients. We have been the very grateful recipients of grant funding from the Arts Council of Placer County to help our youth education programs prosper and grow. We are so grateful to the Arts Council of Placer County and Placer County General for uh, the opportunity to use these funds with our educational outreach programs. Thank you. We are extremely appreciative of the grant money we received from ACPC to present the Floyd, two sold out shows that brought live music and a light show of spectacular proportions to downtown Auburn. We thank you so much for your continued support and we look forward to applying for more grants in the future so we can continue to bring the arts to Auburn. Grant funding is so important to the arts. Arts and culture is something that um, needs to be subsidized in order to effectively deliver it to um, everyone in our communities to make sure that everyone has equal access to the arts. I just want to say a big thank you to the Placer County Board of Supervisors for the funds that they have offered to ACPC and hope that you can continue to support the arts. The Arts Council of Placer County has been an incredible supporter of our work, primarily in the funding of guest artists. We are incredibly thankful to the Board of Supervisors for supporting the Arts Council of Placer County and keep it coming because our community needs this. ACPC would like to thank you for your support. If you would like to learn more about the Arts Council of Placer County, please visit placerarts.org or follow us on social media. I did want to clarify one thing. That was not James Earl Jones doing the voiceover. <laughs> We're very fortunate to have Patrick Storm, who is also in attendance today. He's the one that put that together with Darcy. I want to give total credit to them. They did a great job with it. And I open up for questions now, if anybody has any questions or comments. Thank you so much, Jim. Any questions or comments? Yes, Supervisor Holmes. Jim, thank you for this presentation. We go way back. Uh, I can't say how uh, happy I am that you what the, what you've done in the last what five years now it goes I mean, fast. Coming up, yeah, yeah, it does go it's fast. Really done a great job, Jim. You don't look any older than when I first met you. Though. Well, thank you. I'm at a distance. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I really appreciate the hard work you've done, and it's really really shows um, with the improvements that you made with the Placer County Arts Council. So thank you. I very much appreciate that, Jim, and really like I have to say that the team we have around us, and I didn't mention our outreach team also, which goes out to all the events, is just a marvelous group of people, and they do it because they love the arts, not like we're making them rich, so we really appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Jim, and I appreciated the report because it answered all the questions I sent over earlier about, you know, the grants and the grant recipients, and it's such a diverse group. Um, that through our funding, we're able to help so many of our artists in Placer County. So appreciate that report, and you gave me five years of it. So Thank you. I, know. I, I do want to point out, in case you missed it, in the back of the binder, it's every single grant that we've given out in the Community yes. Arts Grant since we started. So it's a really good chance to look at that, and you can see from your own districts. We, we would have split it in a district also, but a lot of these are kind of regional things. You know, a like absolutely. Take note true, yeah. but really, I think hopefully we're representing all the groups, and if you see that somebody in your district is not there, encourage them to, to use the grants and we'll, we'll try and keep them all happy, so. 
<laughs> well, I think it's important, that, you know, that we're representing all the county all the time, you know, because people can drive across the district line, and those district lines change, you know, every 10 That's years right. or so. So, so, great. Can I ask one question? Yes, absolutely. Um, if people are interested in joining your board, how can they go about finding out information? It's actually listed on our website, Barbara. Did you want to chime in at all on this? <laughs> Barbara's a good recruiter, I'll tell you right now. It's hard to say no to her. Wait, I'm sorry. You do have to come to the mic because <laughs> the member, <laughs> members of the public, members of the public are want to get on the list. <laughs> this is my. I was recently. I'm Barbara Burge, uh, with the Art Council of Placer County, and I don't do this often, so bear with me. Um, and I'm passionate about the arts, so sometimes I go on. <laughs> anyway. Um, so this is the second year that I've been chair. I was just recently reelected. I've been with the Arts Council of Placer County four years. Previously, I was with the Art League of Lincoln for nine years. Um, so I've got a background of arts, et cetera. So when I got the chairperson, I started looking on some of the things that we were doing that did not involve the staff and what we were doing. And I wanted to develop a new board. Um, as people were terming out, and we really focused on diversity uh, and skill sets and uh, wide representation from all of Placer County. So we're working on it. Um, we recently had uh, two wonderful people step down who have been with us forever because they are so busy doing the tour and other things that it's this, they were overwhelmed. Uh, so we are do, looking for it. Go online. Uh, it's an easy process. Uh, Tawana will send you out a simple application, um, and then we meet with you, uh, have a discussion, see where you fit in, whether we're a good fit for you and you're a good fit for us. And we are looking for um, anybody who has a love for the arts. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Great. Well, I don't see any other comments or questions. And I'm sorry. Did oh, that's good. I just want to wrap it up with our, our website is plasterarts.org. So you can go on there. And we also do have an advisory team, too, that the general public, and it's not quite the same commitment. So we look for, we're always looking for people for that, too. So right. thank you. Okay. Are there any public comments on this item? Not seeing any, then I'd entertain a motion to approve. Supervisor Holmes and Jones, roll call. Gore? Aye. Why can't? Yes. Holmes? Aye. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Thank We're you, very Jim. Thank, Thank you. you for all of you coming out today. <clears throat> Before we go to closed session, um, later today uh, when we adjourn, um, I'm going to be asking that we adjourn the meeting um, in memory of. Um, Butte County Sheriff's Department's Lieutenant Leonard Larry Estes. 21 years ago today, uh, Leonard Estes, Larry Estes, was killed in the line of duty. He joined the Butte County Sheriff's Department as a regular deputy sheriff in 1973. He worked patrol in the Paradise area for more than 10 years before spending the next four years at the Butte Interagency Narcotics Task Force. He was promoted to sergeant in 1991 and transferred to investigations in 1994. A year later, he was promoted to lieutenant and named chief deputy coroner of the county. Lieutenant Estes was killed in the line of duty on July 26, 2001. So I know we had a couple members of Chief Estes's team here today, and I wanted to make this announcement before we uh, break for closed session while you could still be here. So, um, did you want to make a comment or? Thank you, Chair Govsasin and members of the board. On behalf of Chief Estes and his family and NEU Placer County Fire, Cal Fire, Nevada Yuba Placer County, um, we thank you for your heartfelt comments and appreciate the board and what they do for us. Thank you. Well, we're so honored to be able to adjourn in his memory today, and please 
We're sorry Chief Estes couldn't be here today for this, but um, we know he's hard at work and um, really uh, incredible career and the legacy he has brought us is our current fire chief for Placer County Fire. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, County Council, closed session. The board will now adjourn to closed session to consider one item of existing litigation and one item of anticipated litigation. Thank you very much. Okay, the board is returned from closed session. County Council, will you give the report? The board met in closed session to consider one item of existing litigation. In the case entitled LC 3S Inc. versus County, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. On the one item of anticipated litigation, potential exposure to litigation, one potential case, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. This concludes the report out of closed session. Thank you very much, Karen. And again, I wanted to announce that we are adjourning today's meeting in honor and memory of Lieutenant Leonard Larry Estes, father of our Placer County Fire Chief Brian Estes. Um, he was killed in the line of duty uh, 21 years ago today. So with that, we'll stand adjourned. Thank you.